In our last session, we finished with a car, a rusted Impala, zooming past Father Tim and Barnabas. And Barnabas did not like the car. Interesting. Chapter 14, Absalom, my son. When he arrived at church the following Sunday, he found his missing Bible lying open on the pulpit. He was flooded with relief, as if a picture hanging crooked on the wall had been set nearly straight again. Rodney Underwood called on Monday afternoon. I've just read an interesting article. It says a ring of English antique dealers have been shipping jewels over here in holler table eggs and secret desk drawers. It says, uh, let's see, it says... Three English dealers are currently under suspicion of shipping rare stolen gems and antique jewelry in furniture transported by ship in sealed containers. So far, authorities have not been able to seize a shipment, as those destined recently for America were diverted to other unknown ports. You don't reckon your jewels could have anything to do with this, do you? Hmm. You don't reckon your jewels could have anything to do with this, do you? Please don't call them my jewels, he thought. I don't think so. Fact is, I just searched the church, thinking that, well, in any case, I didn't find anything. Nothing but a lone candy wrapper, to tell the truth. Candy wrapper? What kind of candy wrapper? Almond Joy. Where'd you find it? In the loft. It was absolutely the only thing up there, as we never used that space at all. What would it be doing up there? I haven't the faintest idea. He felt a creeping alarm that Rodney might deploy fingerprinting crews over the entire church grounds, on account of a harmless candy wrapper. You better let me look at that wrapper, Rodney said. If you want to run by the house and ask Puny to look in my brown pants pocket, I think that's where I put it. I'll send over a cruise car, said Rodney, seemingly pleased with this turn of events. The police chief called back in an hour. You sure you searched the church good? Did you look in behind things? I went over it with a fine-tooth comb. Of course, I didn't pry up any floorboards or... Look behind the bookcases. We got the wrapper and the candy on it's still fresh. You say nobody ever goes in the attic? Nobody. Well, the wrapper's covered with prints, but since you handle it, we'll have to come and take a set of your prints to see what, what, and who's who. Here we go, he thought. Nobody's prints but yours, said Rodney when he called the rectory in the evening. But I'll tell you one thing. <clears throat> What's that? he asked, sitting down on his study sofa with the cordless phone. No other fingerprints means that whoever at that Almond Joy was wearing gloves. You see what I mean? He asked the rector, who clearly didn't. Anybody wearing gloves to eat a candy bar is up to no good. Aha. Uh -huh. What I'm saying is I better, I believe I better come down there tomorrow with the boys and go over the place. Well, and why not? Perhaps the whole thing could be laid to rest. Come ahead, he said. When he arrived at the office the next morning, the phone was ringing. Father, said the caller, Pete Jameson. Pete Jameson? You know, Father, the man you saved. The stranger in the nave. Let me say at once that it was not I who saved you, Pete. That power belongs only to God. How are you, my friend? Coming along, I think. When I get your way again, I'd like to drop by and see you. Right now, I'm calling from a coffee shop in Duluth, Minnesota. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for being there. May I call you again? I'll be disappointed if you don't said the rector, who heard an unmistakable difference in Pete Jameson's voice. Throughout the day, Rodney, Jojo Guthrie, and another officer searched Lord's Chapel. They looked for floorboards that might have been freshly pried up. They pounded on walls, searching for unexpected hollows. They peered under rugs in the nursery, examined the ceiling for loose tiles, removed the covers of heating vents, and generally raised a cloud of dust that caused the rector to cough and sneeze throughout the day. They looked in the garden for any sign that might indicate the planting of something other than bulbs. They put on gloves and masks to remove strips of insulation in the loft. They shone flashlights into the belfry, searched under the kitchen sink of the parish hall, and peered behind the doors of the Redible. Their search, however, revealed nothing more than a long-lost prayer book that had belonged to Wilma Malcolm's grandmother, a box of Palm Sunday bulletins from 1947, and several squirrel nests containing a store of pecans from trees at the rear of the churchyard. Dead gummit, said Rodney, with considerable feeling. <clears throat> Toward the end of the afternoon, the rector felt like walking to the local and buying a box of Little Debbies, any variety, 
and devouring the entire contents in the privacy of his kitchen, nor would he wait for the kettle to boil for tea. In the fading afternoon light, Absalom Greer's slim frame might have been that of a 20-year-old as he hurried down the steps of the old general store. Welcome to God's country, he said, opening the door of the Buick. Get out and come in, father. The rector was astonished to see that the face of his 86-year-old host was remarkably online, and what was more astounding, he had a full head of hair. I was looking for an elderly gentleman to greet me. Pastor Greer might have, must have sent his son. The old man laughed heartily. I can still hear an ant crawling in the grass, he said with satisfaction, but there's not a tooth in my head I can call my own. The country preacher led the village rector up the steps and into the dim interior of the oldest store in several counties. Father Tim felt as if he'd walked into a Rembrandt painting, for the last of the sunlight had turned the color of churned butter, casting a golden glow upon the chestnut walls and hard pine floors. My daddy built this store when I was six years old. It's got the first nails I ever drove. It sold out of the family in 1974, but I bought it back and intend to keep it, though it don't do much toward keeping me. Let me give you a little country cocktail, said his host, who was dressed in a neat gray suit and starched shirt. He selected a cold drink from an icebox behind the cash register, opened it and handed it to the rector. Whew. You're looking at where I do my best preaching, he said, slapping the worn wood of the counter. Right here is where the rubber hits the road. Like the Greeks said to Philip, sir, we would see Christ. If they don't... Ah, like the Greeks said to Philip, sir, we would see Christ. If they don't see him behind this counter six days a week, we might as well throw my Sunday preaching out the window. Where's your weekday pulpit, my friend? Main Street. That's a good place. Some soldiers sit round and smell the coffee and watch the bacon frying, but the battle is waged on your feet. Absalom, said a quiet voice from the back of the store. Supper's ready. You can come any time. A door closed softly. My sister, Lottie, the old man said with evident pride. She lives with me and does the cooking and housekeeping. I can assure you that I never did anything to deserve her ministry to me. She is an angel of the Lord. His host turned the sign on the front door to read closed, and they walked the length of a narrow store on creaking floorboards, passing bins of seed and nails, rows of canned goods, sacks of feed, thread, buttons, iron skillets, and aluminum wash tubs. Absalom Greer pushed open a door, and the rector stood on the threshold in happy amazement. Before him was a room with ancient leaded windows gleaming with the last rays of sunlight. In the center of the room stood a large table laid with a white cloth and a variety of steaming dishes. And on it burned an oil lamp. In the corner of the room, a fire crackled in the grate, and books lined the walls behind a pair of comfortable reading chairs. A worn black Bible lay on the table next to one of the chairs, and an orange cat curled peacefully on the deep windowsill. He thought he'd never entered a home so peaceable in spirit. A tall, slender woman moved into the room from the kitchen, wearing an apron. Her blue dress became her graying hair, which was pulled back simply and tied with a ribbon. She smiled shyly and extended her hand. Father Tim, said Absalom Greer, Lottie Miller, my joy and my crown, my earthly shield and buckler, and my widowed sister. It's my great pleasure, said the rector, feeling as if he'd gone to another country to visit. My sister is shy as a deer, Father. We don't get much company in here, as I do all my pastoring at church or in the store. Why don't you sit where you can see the little fire on the hearth? It's always a consolation. After washing up in a tidy bathroom, Father Tim sat down at the table, finding, <laughs> finding that even the hardback chair seemed comforting. I left school when I was 12, said Absalom Greer over dinner, to help my daddy in the store, and I got along pretty good teaching myself at night. One evening, along about the age of 14, I was back here in this very room, studying a book. The wind got to howling and blowing as bad as you ever heard. Lottie was a baby in my mother's arms. I can see them now. My mother sitting by the fire, rocking Lottie and humming a tune, and I was sitting right there on a little bed. My eyes were as wide open as they are now, when suddenly I saw a great band of angels. This room was filled with the brightness of angels. They were pure white, with color only in their wings. Color like a prism casts when the sun shines through it. I never saw anything so beautiful in my life, before or since. 
I couldn't speak a word, and my mother went on rocking and humming with her eyes closed, and there were angels standing over her, and all around us was this shining heavenly host. Then it seemed as if a golden stair let down there by the door, and the angels turned and swarmed up that staircase and were gone. I remember I went to sobbing, but my mother didn't hear it, and I reached up to wipe my tears, but there weren't any there. I thought about it many a time over the years, and I think it was my spirit that was weeping with joy. Lottie Miller had not spoken, but had passed each dish and platter, it seemed to the rector, at just the right time. He had a second helping of potatoes that had been sliced and fried with rock salt and chives, and another helping of roasted lamb, which was as fine as any lamb he'd tasted in a very long time. Oh my goodness, I'm glad I had a meal before this. Reading about really tasty food is a challenging thing when you have a vivid imagination. It's a mystery how I could have done it, but I completely forgot that heavenly vision, said the preacher, who was buttering a biscuit. Long about 16, I got the feeling I had no soul at all. They'd take me to hear a preaching and I couldn't hear it. They'd take me to see a healing and I couldn't see it. My daddy said it was the name they'd put on me, Absalom, a wicked, rebellious, ungodly character if there ever was one. But my mother was young when I was born and heedless, and she liked the sound of it, and I was stuck with it. Later on, when I got to reading the word, I got to understand an Absalom and his daddy and that pitiful relationship. And the name got to be a blessing to me instead of a curse. And praise God, some of my best preaching has come out of my name. Well, along about 20, I kissed my mother and daddy goodbye and my baby sister and walked to Wesley and took the train. And I went out west, carrying a cardboard box tied up with twine. Times were so hard I couldn't get a job. I ended up putting the cardboard from that box in the bottom of my shoes. A fellow told me the bottom of one foot said cream of wheat, and the other said this side up. I walked on that box for three months till I got work in a silver mine. Way down deep in that mine, in that dark pit, I heard the Lord call me, Absalom, my son. He was clear as day. Go home. Go home and preach my word to your people. Well, sir, I didn't know his word to preach it. But I up and started home, took the train back across this great land, got off at Westney, walked 12 miles to Farmer in the middle of the night with a full moon shining, and I got to my mother's and daddy's door right up there, and I laid down with the dogs and went to sleep on a flour sack. I remember I told myself I'd never heard the Lord call me in that mine, that I'd just been lonesome, was looking for an excuse to come home. I went on like that for a year or two, went to church to look at the girls, helped my daddy in the store. But that wasn't enough, somehow. Something was sorely missing. One day, I commenced to read everything theological I could get my hands on. I drenched myself in Spurgeon, plowed through Calvin. I soaked up Whitefield and gorged on Matthew Henry as hard as I could go. But I was fighting my calling, and my heart was like a stone. One day, I was sitting in the orchard I planted as a boy, and the Lord spoke again. Absalom, my son, he said, clear as day. Spread my word to your people. It made the hair stand up on my head. But in five minutes, I had laid down in the sunshine and gone to sleep like a lizard. I went on that way for about three years, not listening to God, till one night he woke me up. I thought I'd been hit by a blow on the head with a two-by-four. It was like a bolt of lightning knocked me out of bed and threw me to the floor. Blam! Absalom, my son, said the Lord. Go preach my word to your people and be quick about it. I got up off that floor, I ran in here where it was cold enough to preserve a corpse, I wrapped up in a blanket and lit an oil lamp, and I got to reading that good book, and for two years, I did not stop. Everybody who knew me thought I'd gone soft. Absalom Greer's got religion, they said, but they were only partly right. It was religion that had got me. It was God himself who had me at last, and it was the most thrilling time of my life. The words would jump off the page. I would understand things I'd never understand, understood before. I could take a verse my tongue had glibbed over in church and see in it wondrous and thrilling meanings that kept the hair standing up on my head. I would go out to work at the lumber company and take it with me. I would sit on the toilet and read it. I would walk to town reading, and I'd be so transported I would fall in the ditch and get up and go again, turn to the page. I felt God spoke to me continuously for two transcendent years. Glory, glory, glory said the old preacher with shining eyes. One Sunday morning, I was sitting in that little church about three miles down the road there, 
and Joshua Hoover was pastoring then. I remember when I was sitting there in that sweet little church and Pastor Hoover come down the aisle and he was white as a ghost. He said, Absalom, God has asked me to let you preach to service this morning. I like to drop down dead at his feet. He said, I don't know about this. It makes me uneasy, but it's what the Lord told me to do. When I stood up, my legs gave out under me. I like to faint it like a girl. Lottie Miller laughed softly. I recalled something Billy Sunday said. He said, if you want milk and honey on your bread, you have to go into the land of giants. So I went into that pulpit and I prayed and the congregation, they prayed. And the first thing you know, the Holy Spirit got to moving in that place. And I got to preach in the word of God. And pretty soon it was just like a mill wheel got to turning. And we all went to grinding corn. Bliss, said the rector, filled with understanding. Bliss, my friend, indeed. There is nothing like it on earth when the Spirit of God comes pouring through, and he has poured through me in fair weather and foul for 64 years. Have there been any dry spells? The preacher pushed his plate away, and Lottie rose to clear the table. Father Tim smelled the kind of coffee he remembered from Mississippi, strong and black and brewed on the stove. My brother, dry is not the word. There was a time I went down like a stone in a pond and sank clear to the bottom. I lay on the bottom of that pond for two miserable years, and I thought I'd never see the light of day in my soul again. I can't say my current tribulation is anything like that, but in an odd way, it's something almost worse. What's that? Absalom Greer asked kindly. When it comes to feeding his sheep, I'm afraid my sermons are about as nourishing as cardboard. Are you resting? Resting? Resting. Sometimes we get so worn out with being useful that we get useless. Well, that's something to keep in mind. I'll ask you what another preacher once asked. Are you too exhausted to run and too scared to rest? Too scared to rest? He would never thought of it in that way. When in God's name are you going to take a vacation? Poppy had asked again only the other day. He hadn't known the truth then, but he felt he knew it now. Yes, he was too scared to rest. The old preacher's eyes were clear as gemstones. My brother, I would urge you to search the heart of God on this matter, for it was this very thing that sank me to the bottom of the pond. They look at, looked at one another with grave understanding. I'll cover your prayers, said Father Tim. As the two men sat by the fire and discussed the Newland wedding, Lottie Miller shyly drew up an armchair and joined them. She sat with her eyes lowered to the knitting in her lap. Miss Lottie, said Father Tim, that was as fine a meal as I've enjoyed in a very long time. I thank you for the beauty and the goodness of it. Thank you for being here, she said with obvious effort. Absalom and I don't have supper company often, and I'm proud for my brother to have an educated man to talk with. It's a blessing to him. An educated man, thought Father Tim. It is Absalom Greer who is educating me. Take home a peck of our apples. Lottie handed him a basket of what appeared to be Rome beauties. If you like them, said her brother, we'll give you a bushel when you come again. <clears throat> I'm deeply obliged. We have quite an orchard in Mitford, as you may know. Miss Sadie Baxter is the grower of what we've come to call the Baxter apple. A strange look crossed, crossed Lottie Miller's face. Miss Sadie Baxter, Absalom said quietly, I once made a proposal of marriage to that fine lady. Rain again, he thought, as he put the tea kettle on. But every drop that fell contained the promise of another leaf, another blossom, another blade of grass in the spring. Better still, it would help make Russell Jacks's wish come true, for the buds forming on the rhododendron were as large as old-fashioned Christmas tree lights. Mm -hmm. Though it was fairly warm, he had laid a fire, thinking that he and Dooley might have supper in the study. But when he looked in the refrigerator, he found little to inspire him. Scraps, he said, as the phone rang. Hello, father, said his neighbor. I remembered that Puny isn't there on Thursdays, and I made a boulevaise with fresh shrimp and mussels from the local. May I bring you a potful? Providence, he thought, and one of his favorite dishes to boot. Well, now. Oh, and crab meat. I used crab meat, and I promise it isn't scorched or burned, he laughed. I could just pop through the hedge, she said. Indeed not. I'll ask Dooley to come for it. And I have two lemon pies here that Puny baked yesterday. I'll send one over. 
I love lemon pies, she said. Of course, we'd be very glad to have you join us here. Dooley will be getting his science project done on the floor of the study, so you wouldn't mind a bit of a muddle. Oh, but you should see the muddle here. I'd be glad to exchange my muddle for yours. All right, then. Fish stew and lemon pie it is. Give us an hour, if you will. I will, and I look forward to it, she said. He couldn't help thinking that his neighbor sounded like a young girl who'd just been invited to a tea party. While he was shaving, the phone rang. Dooley appeared at the bathroom door and handed him the cordless. It's a woman, he said, and sat down on the closed lid of the toilet seat to listen. Father Tim held the phone away from the lather on his face. Hello? Father, this is Olivia. Olivia, you've been very much on my mind. I could feel it. I've strongly felt your prayers. Something odd seems to be happening. I'm all ears. And all lather, he thought, noting that he'd gotten a great deal of it on the phone. I feel I'm being released from the fear of seeking a transplant. It's just, I feel the fear is being lifted somehow. You know I've poured over every possibility, every hazard. I've done my homework. It, it doesn't make sense to consider a transplant. Even Leo finally agreed with that. I thought it was all settled, and now... And this is the oddest thing of all. There's a sense in which I'm afraid of losing the fear. Fear is one of the enemy's deadliest strategies. Fight this fear, Olivia. Dooley watched him. But how strange that I might be having a change of heart, she said. Have you told this to the one who wants to hear it even more than I? No, she said. I just don't feel sure enough. I feel confused. Will you pray for me to have wisdom in this? I don't want to die, Father. I thought I was resigned to it, but I'm not. I'm not. You know I love it when you talk like this, he said. Pray for me, she said. And the lightness of her voice touched him. You sure get a lot of calls from women, Dooley said sullenly, taking the phone. The rector noticed that the boy's cowlick was standing straight up. My friend, a priest gets a lot of calls from everybody. In fact, there are times when I'd like nothing better than to open the window and throw the phone in the yard. I could tell him you ain't here, aren't here. No response. That, however, would be a lie, wouldn't it? I reckon. No reckon about it. It would be a lie, and a lie is a hateful thing. Why? For one, telling a lie is like eating peanuts. One leads to another, and in no time at all you've gone through a bag full. He rinsed the razor under the tap. Worst of all, you become a slave to something that isn't real. We've been reading about slaves. I wouldn't want to be one. Let me say again, lying will make you a slave. For whoever tells a lie is a servant of that lie. I hope you'll hide that in your heart, son. He put his hand on the boy's shoulder. Now, why don't we do something with that cowlick before company comes? Cynthia arrived, wearing a pair of blue oven mitts and carrying a large stew pot. She set the pot on the stove and handed Dooley the book that was tucked under her arm. This is for you. It's my latest book and it has a boy with red hair in it. Dooley looked at the cover. This old violet stuff is for babies, he said, offended. It most certainly is not. It's for readers up to ten years old. I'm eleven, said Dooley, but I'm grown for my age. A likely story, thought the rector. Okay, said Cynthia, do this. Read it. And if you don't like it, you never have to read another violent book as long as you live. Dooley has been known to make up his mind in advance of the facts. I understand perfectly. I was afflicted with that very trait for years on end. Are we having hot chocolate tonight? Dooley asked. We are as soon as you finish your science project. Double marshmallows for you. While I'm in the kitchen, why don't you poke up the fire for Miss Coppersmith? Call me Cynthia, she said to Dooley. Would you like to see our train? asked Dooley. Oh, I would. I love trains. Was there anything his neighbor didn't love? He wondered. What's that smell? Father Tim took the lid off the steaming pot, and the aroma lifted from it like a fragrant cloud. This, my friend, is a delicacy of the rarest sort. In plain language, fish stew. Yuck! I'm not eating that stuff. Thanks be to God, there'll be more for the rest of us. You don't know what you're missing, said their neighbor with some asperity. There's octopus in here. Dooley looked at the pot with alarm. Not to mention good old scrod. Scrod and fish eyes. Mmm, delicious. My favorite. So tender. Yuck, gag, said Dooley, fleeing to the study. Cynthia laughed with delight. 
I hope you'll forgive an innocent lie. Well, he said, grinning, but just this once. I done read half of that book, said Dooley, who had finished eating his fried bologna sandwich and was working on his science project. I read it while you all was in the kitchen. And what did you think? asked Cynthia. Cool. Thank you, she said, obviously pleased. The table that had the table had been moved from the bookcase to the fireplace and covered with a damask cloth that had come with the rectory. Dooley had lighted a green Christmas candle and set it in the saucer, and overall the effect was so festive that they lingered over the lemon pie and coffee. Again, your boulebaise was outstanding. I'm glad you liked it, she smiled almost shyly. Gross, said Dooley. By the way, said his neighbor, if you catch any moles this spring, this spring, I'd truly like to have one. The idea was so grisly that Barnabas, who was lying by the fire, caught the sense of it and growled. A dead mole. He'd never had such an odd and unwholesome request in his life. I'm about to puke, said Dooley, vanishing into the kitchen. I suppose you think Beatrix Potter drew her creatures from imagination, or for one fleeting glance at something scampering across the path. You mean she didn't? Of course not. She drew from life, or death, if you will. Though by far the most unusual, that is to say, unique person I've had the privilege of meeting in years. You are only too kind to call me unusual. I've been called worse. He smiled. You don't say. Peculiar? No. Curious? Certainly not. And even eccentric? Entirely inaccurate. She sighed. There are those, he said, who call me odd as well, so I understand. I was without a car for nearly eight years and took up with a maverick dog who was disciplined only by the recitation of scripture. How I wish that all of us might be disciplined that way. There, he thought. What a grand thing to say. How did you become an artist? My mother was artistic, my father too, and I was an only child. They taught me to see. Yes, I think that's the very best way to put it. I didn't just look at a painting or a picture. I looked at every single facet of it, and a tiny flower that most people tread underfoot. Well, we'd look at it very closely and find such extraordinary detail. To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower. He quoted from Blake. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour, she replied. For that alone, you deserve a mole. I can't bring myself to make any promises, but I'll see what I can do. She laughed. I've learned not to live on any promises other than God's, actually. That is wisdom indeed. The kind one usually comes by the hard way. It was hard, all right. I was married for many years to a man who became an important public figure. I'm perhaps the least public person on earth. That's a terrible kind of division to have in a marriage. And he wanted children. He was desperate for children and I couldn't give them to him. I learned he had at least three, all by different women. Her eyes, which she always found so vividly blue, appeared oddly gray. His mother's death had been the keenest pain in his memory. And his conflict with his father had refused to give him any lasting peace. Yet compared to the grief and heartache revealed to him by others, he felt as if he had lived a nearly idyllic existence. I must tell you, she said, that I never dreamed I'd be sitting here now, alive, and happier than I've ever been or ever dreamed of being, successful in my work with my own home and no mortgage, and a gracious neighbor who's gone out of his way to make me feel welcome. I must admit something. What's that? I haven't gone out of my way in the least. Oh, rats, she said, laughing. I was hoping you had. Her eyes were blue again. But what about you? Have you ever had a broken heart? One thing he could say for his neighbor, she caught one off guard. While several had asked if he'd ever been in love, no one had ever directly inquired after his heart. Dooley, he called to the kitchen without taking his eyes from Cynthia, isn't it about time for hot chocolate? He made the hot chocolate with milk, put three mugs on a tray and walked back to the study where he found his neighbor on her hands and knees with Dooley waiting for the train to come through the tunnel. Rain pattered on the roof. The boy looked happy and confident. There was laughter in his home. And as he set the tray on the table, the fire crackled invitingly. He wasn't, wasn't unaware that it all combined to give him a feeling of unutterable pleasure. A renewed running schedule had increased his energy. He had finished his Lenten homilies and Dooley Barlow had said, thank you, all of four times. 
Evie Adams' mother had stopped putting the wet wash in the oven, and the nursing home building committee had chosen an architect. What did it matter that the bells were once again delayed when so many other things were chiming along nicely? On Sunday morning, as he and Dooley were starting up for the eight o'clock service, he saw his neighbor wa walking briskly up the sidewalk. She was wearing a small hat and navy suit, and looking, he thought, quite a picture. Good morning, he called out. Good morning to you. Hi, Dooley. You look terrific in suspenders. I thought I'd just pop over to your early service and see what's up with the Anglicans before I go along to the Presbyterians. We'll be thrilled to have you. Thanks. It's such a beautiful morning, I thought I'd get there a bit early and enjoy the calm. As she said that, he, for some unexplicable reason, looked down at her shapely legs, which brought her feet into view. Seeing what must have been a bewildered look on his face, she also looked down. She was still wearing her terry cloth bedroom shoes with the embroidered violets. Oh no, she said miserably. Without another word, she turned and fled into the little, into the little house. That was funny, said Dooley. He hated even to think it, but he could understand perfectly why she should never have been a senator's wife. P-daddle, said Emma, attempting to total the first quarter's offerings. We didn't collect 180,000. It was only 18,000. Decimals can be tricky, he said. However, that's not bad, considering the recession. What recession? I know you've been busy with your wedding plans, but do you mean to say you didn't know we're in a recession? All I know is the post office has cut so far back, Harold has to bring his own toilet tissue to work. No. Yes, can you believe it? And with stamps gone up to boot. The phone rang, and Emma listened patiently to the caller, before handing the receiver to Father Tim. Evie Adams, she whispered. Hello, Evie, how are you? That, thought Emma, is not a good question to ask Evie Adams. Is that right? You don't say. Ah, I understand. I'm sorry. Well, then, I'll come by right after lunch. Yes, of course. I'll pray for you. He hung up and shook his head. Last week, Miss Patty took her bath while holding an open umbrella over her head. No. Well, there was a drip in the shower nozzle. That explains it. And when Evie had a bridge luncheon yesterday, Miss Patty made a centerpiece out of Evie's red pumps and filled them with daffodils. That sounds kind of cute. I wouldn't mind trying that. Well, we'll see what your new husband would think of such a thing. My new husband, Emma said, almost rapturously. Do you know he begged me last night to do it at the courthouse? He's so bashful about this big wedding. Dottie told him in no way am I wearing that red suit with the black trim to the courthouse. We have slaved over that outfit. Not really. I can imagine. I saw your neighbor coming out of the early service on Sunday. Really? And I saw Hoppy Harper drive off with Olivia Davenport after the 11 o'clock. Is that right? Is she still dying? She is still living, which is more than I can say for most people. Well, you don't have to get huffy about it, she replied. He opened a letter containing photos of a former parishioner's new grandchild. Amazing. The infant looked precisely like Dick Satterfield wearing a crocheted hat. You know what you ought to do? Emma asked suddenly. I can't imagine. You ought to get out more. Take Dooley to a movie in Wesley. Boys like movies. He continued to read the letter that came with the photos. Or, she said, peering at him over her glasses, take your neighbor. He swiveled in his chair to face the bookcase. Harold and Dottie and I saw a great movie the other night. The, uh, something, something, something was the name. You know, everybody's talking about it. Is that right? Oh, P. Daddle, I can't think of the name to save my life. You know what it is, the, the something, something, something. Who's in it? He asked tepidly. Oh, uh, what's his name? You know. He did not know and did not want to know. Can't you think? She asked. It was all over TV, saying it was coming to a theater near you. She furrowed her brow. Seems like it starts with a B. The something, something, B, something. Aha. Uh -huh. This just drives me crazy. Don't you know all those clips of it on TV? There's this woman with long black hair, kind of like Loretta Young, and this man that looks like Cesar Romero, but it's not. I don't. I know you know who I mean, kind of tall. Dear God, thought it, Father Tim, when you made Emma Garrett, you broke the mold. Well, anyway, she said, you ought to go see it. It's at the Avon over in Wesley. 
It's that new place over around the farmer's market. You know, you make a turn somewhere around there. I can't remember if it's left or right. And then there's a tire store maybe on the corner. Oh, no, I think that's a laundrette. Well, anyway, you can't make a U-turn there. So I go on down to the post office and turn around in their parking lot. That's what Harold does. I think it's the post office. It might be the library. And then a block or two, you're there. Can't miss it. Is there no bomb in Gilead? He wondered. He still wasn't sleeping soundly. Recently, he not only had trouble falling asleep, but staying asleep. In the night watches, as the psalmist had called them, he found himself wondering again and again about Andrew Gregory and the hollow table lakes Rodney had mentioned and the newspaper clipping he'd seen at the Oxford. He was relieved to discover that he couldn't imagine Andrew doing such a thing as trafficking in stolen goods, jewels or otherwise. Andrew Gregory breaking into the church and hiding jewels in a closet he very likely knew nothing about. Andrew Gregory in his beautiful suits and cashmere jackets, stumbling around in the dark like a common thief. No, it wouldn't work. Never. Andrew Gregory could not possibly be involved. Thanks be to God. After such thoughts, which he went over and over again, went over again and again, he would drift off to sleep, only to awaken with fresh concerns. While the stolen jewels mentioned in the clipping had been in necklaces and such, couldn't those same jewels have been taken from their mountings to prevent a link to the museum theft? And could it be that those very jewels were put into the leg of an English farm table, perhaps, and shipped to Andrew in one of those vast containers he received twice a year? And if the authorities had linked the thefts to antique dealers, wouldn't he have removed the jewels from his own premises at once, and possibly into a church, where no one would ever think of looking? For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, he reminded himself more than once, as Paul had reminded Corinth. Confusion was ungodly, the hour was ungodly, and Barnabas had lately begun to snore in an alternate bass and baritone. He would drift off to sleep again, only to wake and look at the clock. Andrew Gregory, the very soul of graciousness, the lover of rare books, of Wordsworth, for heaven's sake. No, not Andrew, never. On Saturday, after Dooley went to Meadowgate for the weekend, he turned off the telephone and lay down on the study sofa, where he slept for ten hours under the crocheted afghan when he had given him for Christmas. He was awakened by a barking in the garage and was bewildered to see that it was night time. After taking Barnabas to the hedge and feeding him, he lay down again in the study exhausted and waited for the eleven o'clock news. He should have visited Russell Jacks today, gone to see Olivia, bathed Barnabas, cleaned up the garage, vacuumed his car, shined his shoes, bundled up the newspaper for recycling. How very odd, he thought to have slept through an entire day, something he couldn't remember ever doing before. He felt strangely disoriented and feebly guilty, and for a moment could not remember the crux of his sermon for tomorrow. At a quarter of eleven, the phone rang. Father, said Hoppy Harper, Olivia is in trouble. At Olivia's home on Lilac Road, Hoppy opened the door. You're not going to like this, he said. What won't I like? The way she looks. You'll be shocked. Very likely. I've been shocked before, my friend. Hoppy ran his fingers through his disheveled hair. I've talked to Leo Baldwin. Last week I took a risk and put her on the national waiting list. She doesn't know I did that. Good, the nick of time, he said, observing his friend's anguished look. As they walked down the hall, he laid his hand on Hoppy's shoulder. Whatever we do, let's remember who's in charge here. Olivia's housekeeper, Mrs. Kershaw, stood outside the bedroom door, wiping her red eyes with a handkerchief and lustily blowing her nose. As they went into Olivia's bedroom, he saw only a large, high-ceilinged room with softly colored walls and a deep carpet. Silk draperies began at the ceiling and cascaded to the floor. Lamps glowed here and there in the room, creating pools of warm light. Even in view of the circumstances, he sensed that he'd stepped into a treasury of calm and peace. Hello, father, a voice said breathlessly. He turned and saw Olivia in a silk dressing gown sitting in a chair. Tears sprang at once to his eyes, and he was glad for the dimness of the light, for all his priestly experience was sorrow and was shock. Nothing had prepared him for this. Father, she said, lifting her hand slightly from her lap. She was so swollen that he wouldn't have recognized her, and her alabaster skin, always such a stunning foil for her violet eyes, was an alarming shade of yellow. He called upon every professional strategy he knew to appear composed. Olivia, he said, simply taking her hand. 
He didn't recognize his own voice. Shocking, she said, gasping for the breath to say it. He looked at her feet, which were propped on a footstool. They were more than twice their normal size. He couldn't help but notice that a pair of bedroom slippers beside the footstool looked foolishly small. It's the congestion, Poppy said. It's backing up from around her heart and enlarging the liver. I'm putting her in intensive care for a couple of weeks, using some IV drugs to move the fluid around. Mrs. Kershaw, have you packed her things? Mrs. Kershaw was now weeping openly without the formality of a handkerchief. She picked up the blue suitcase standing by the bedroom door and carried it into the foyer. Olivia's desperate struggle for breath created the most agonizing sound the rector had heard since his mother's harsh illness. He dropped to his knees by her feet and taking her hands in his began to pray. Socks, Hobby said. Is there a pair of socks she can wear? Socks? asked Mrs. Kershaw with dignity. Miss Olivia does not wear socks. Miss Kershaw tenderly wrapped her mistress's feet in scarves and took a dark mink coat from the closet as insulation against the night air. Hoppy bent over and put one arm behind Olivia's shoulder and then another under her knees. Carefully, he picked her up from the chair. She can't lie down in the ambulance because of her breathing and there's nothing they can do for her. We'll take her in my car. It was precisely 12 midnight when the doors swung open to the emergency hall and Hoppy carried his patient inside. The doctor came swiftly along the corridor, carrying a woman wrapped in scarves and fur, whose dark, unbound hair swept over his arm like a mantilla. Get the trip started, he said to a nurse, who was wheeling a stretcher toward them. Oxygen, EKG, the works. As he laid her on the stretcher with pillows under her head, Olivia looked at the rector. She was fighting for air like a fish stranded on the beach. Philip Bins, 413, for... Pete's sake, she said, and smiled. Hook her up, said the doctor. How did she get so stricken? The rector asked, as they stood outside Olivia's room in the intensive care unit. I knew she wasn't feeling her best, but she assured me it was nothing. I saw her only days ago. It flares up without warning, and she couldn't face that it was happening. She'd been well compensated for several months, and she let herself believe the unbelievable. When the relapse came, she let it go too long. Mrs. Kershaw was under strict orders not to call me. What next? God knows, she could arrest at any time. What does that mean? Exactly. She could die. Hoppy snapped his fingers. Just like that. I see. Pray for me when I tell her I put her on the list. That prayer may already be answered. She's been considering that, but didn't want you to know until she came to a firm decision. Where do we go from here? I'll keep her a couple of weeks at least. Then we can let her go home, if all goes well. It will go well, Father Tim said with unusual conviction. Hoppy took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes. You need to know that a third of the patients on the waiting list will die while waiting. That means, the rector replied evenly, that two thirds of them will not die while waiting. Hoppy looked at him for a moment. You're a good guy, he said. When he arrived home at two o'clock, after looking in, in on Russell Jacks, he hurried to Dooley's room to see if he was sleeping soundly, then remembered the boy was at Meadowgate. He sat on the side of his bed in a daze until nearly 2.30, when he finally undressed and lay down, taking care to set the alarm for five. He was surprised and dismayed that he did something he hadn't done since childhood. He wept until he fell asleep. Whew, tough chapter. I think we'll end it there for tonight. Chapter 15 is what we're on. I have a class to teach tomorrow at 7, but I think I will be back in time for 8.30. So see you tomorrow night at 8.30 as usual. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you then.